Karen uh, mentioned the word Proterozoic, and for the audience, uh, I probably should uh, do a bit of basic geology. Proterozoic is the Earth's middle age, and I've spent a lot of my research career working on sedimentary basins that are of Proterozoic age. So I've come to this fossil story with a, a broader interest in the ore deposits in Proterozoic basins and the way in which they form. And many of these ore deposits formed on the sea floor and just as we find in the modern oceans today with hydrothermal vents there would have been uh, biology, uh, a biota or an ecosystem that existed around them. So that sort of got me interested, the ore deposits got me interested in what might be living around them and since, I, since the university stopped paying me and I've had more spare time, I've gotten a bit more interested in uh, protozoic fossils close at home. So I will advance the talk. I ch I ch that was my attempt at a joke, Tasmania's oldest fossil, but uh, it's already been made, so we'll, we'll move on. The, the image there is the site, of the is the locality where Tasmania's oldest fossils come from. Uh, to the best of our knowledge, uh, it's the only site that has abundant examples of these things. Uh, you'll see later in the talk they're quite cryptic uh, in their appearance and you need the right weather conditions and the right light to be able to see them. Later on, you can take the time to peruse uh, a slab that was donated by the person who found these fossils uh, over to my... I've got to not turn away from the microphone, so I'm going to look to my left. There's some rocks at the front of the room which you can look at at your leisure. All right. So there's a subtitle to this talk, which is What do a paleontologist from New Jersey, a 19th century Irish rebel, some of the bloodiest battles of the American Civil War, and a 1.4 billion year old fossil from the Tarkine have in common? Now, I'm not going to answer that question immediately, but by the end of the talk, uh, hopefully the answers will be revealed. So getting back to the topic at hand, see what you're seeing. Getting back to the topic at hand, about a little more than a decade ago now, uh, this announcement of the discovery of a very old fossil in the Tarkine made the front page of the Mercury. Uh, you can see Clive Kelver uh, on the right of that picture and Martin Lan, uh, the people that described the fossil. Marty was the discoverer of the fossils and I'll just say a little bit more about the discovery of the fossils. It's a nice example of coincidence or serendipity. The house, the structure you can see there is the house that Martin Land built in Belfer, the old mining centre in the northwest. Uh, at the time, he wanted some paving stones for the front of his bush house. He knew of this quarry a few kilometres away, a little bit to the north, and he went collecting paving stones. But he was Martin trained as a geologist many years ago. He's been a prospector and a field assistant over the years. He was smart enough to recognise that there was something interesting in some of the slabs he collected, these little string of bead-like features, dot-like features. He showed these to a, another geologist from Mineral Resources Tasmania, I think it was John Pemberton, who then talked to them, talked to Clive Calver about. And Clive, the light bulb went off and he thought they sounded a lot like fossils that he knew of from Montana, and I'll say a little bit more about those in a minute. So Clive recognised them as, string of, as these string of beads things from Proterozoic rocks in Canada. Clive knew Kath Gray, a, a real paleontologist with the Western Australian Geological Survey, who'd also uh, previously worked on string of beads fossils, and they wrote a paper in 2010 and gave the Tasmanian fossils the name Horodiscia Williams I. Uh, Horodiscia was the name used for the for the North American examples, uh, but they recognised uh, a species, if you like, that they named William's Eye uh, in honour of a geologist who discovered Horodiscia in Western Australia, the third occurrence. So we'll keep going. So what do the Tasmanian things look like? There's uh, a number of slabs here and a piece of rock showing the layers in the rock, so these are fine-grained grey to dark grey to pale laminated sedimentary rocks. When you split them along the bedding planes, they sometimes reveal features that you can see in the images on the screen. They're not very big, they're not big sort of pearl necklaces, they're just tiny little millimetre to millimetre and a half dots. Uh, some of them 
have a connection that's visible, but um, most of the time you're not seeing that connection. But they have a structure to them that allow that makes them clearly recognisable as being like the original discoveries in Montana. So we go to Montana now. This is a photograph I took up in Glacier National Park uh, when I had the opportunity to go looking. Uh, for the Montana Horodiscia, the original discoveries, they were found in Glacier National Park by the paleontologist from New Jersey. His name was Bob Horodisky. Uh, Bob did his PhD at UCLA in the 70s in a, in a group there that were very interested in Proterozoic paleobiology. He then did a lot of field work in Proterozoic Age rocks in the Rocky Mountains in, in Montana. He found and published a paper in the 1980s where he talked about things, he didn't call them, didn't give them a, a biological name, he called them problematic bedding surface markings. Uh, eventually, 15 years later, they were described by paleontologists and given the name Horodiscia in Bob's honour. Bob had subsequently died at a young age, which was rather unfortunate. The other point to make here is the rocks that the Montana fossils are found in belong to a sedimentary basin known as the Belt basin. Uh, and you can see it on the uh, right-hand side of the diagram. It straddles uh, the western side of Montana, Idaho, and runs up into Canada where it gets renamed when it crosses the 49th parallel. The Belt Basin draws its name from a couple of mountain ranges right in the middle of Montana uh, known as the Little Belt and Big Belt Mountains. And that's a photograph I took about 30 years ago uh, when I had an opportunity to spend a beautiful summer in Montana in the little town of White Sulphur Springs. There is a third occurrence of Horodiscia, and that's in the Bangamore Basin in the middle of Western Australia, another protozoic basin. Uh, I should have mentioned the Montana uh, Horodiscia were well dated at about 1.4 billion years. When the paper was published on the Tasmanian ones, the best estimate of the age was a little bit more than a billion years, so it wasn't very well constrained. They knew it was older than some rocks that were seven, eight hundred million years old in northwest Tasmania, but there was no direct dating of the Tasmanian examples. The Belt Basin ones were well constrained at about 1.4 billion years, and the Western Australian ones shown here, again, are not particularly well constrained. They're probably older than a billion, but they could be as old as 1.4. So at the time that the the Tasmanian examples were published. I had uh, a student who was doing honours and in an honours project he did uh, research to try and narrow in and get a better age for the Tasmanian examples. Before I talk about how that was done for, for the audience, I want to talk a little bit about geologists and how we think about time and, and why this is important. Uh, so. Geologists in the audience can just doze off now, they learned all, they know all this, but there's something called the geological time scale, which is in arguably geology's greatest contribution to modern scientific thought. And the development of the geological time scale really began uh, back in the, in the early stages of the Enlightenment, before the biologists got in on the game with Darwin and evolutionary theory, before the physicists had any idea that the universe was 13.8 billion years old. So geologists were ahead of the game when it came to thinking about deep time. And arguably it started with the recognition by people like William Smith in, in England and Cuvier in France that certain rocks had characteristic fossils would be found in them. And these fossils not only were they character, characteristic of certain rocks, there was a sequence and, a, and patterns in the distribution and changes in these fossils. And that allowed William Smith to produce the first geological map that uh, looks for all intents and purposes like a modern geological map. He produced a map of England uh, that was published, I think, in 1815 by the Geological Society. And Essentially what you're seeing there are different colours of different age rocks based on their, their characteristic fossils and paleontologists refer to these as index fossils and that allowed the development of a time scale like the one you see on the left hand side of the, of, of the right hand side of the uh, picture over there. So this is the geological time scale, it's got some pictures of or organisms you might recognise, dinosaurs in the Mesozoic, 
humans not till much later on, trilobites back in, in the Paleozoic. So uh, a sense of time and sequence of rocks, that if you've got fossils, and they're the right fossils, you can nail down very narrowly the age of a sequence. And that's been refined over the years to something we call the geological time scale. And it's very granular. For the last 540 million years, back to the start of the Cambrian era, uh, when there was this explosion of life in the oceans, we can use fossils to subdivide the uh, geological record down to uh, uh, a precision of only a few million years in many cases. So the details on that don't matter, but you can see by looking at the uh, right hand side of the each or the left hand side of each of those columns that there's a lot of detail beyond things simply Mesozoic, Paleozoic, Cenozoic. But that's only part of the story. If we look at the entire geological record, the age going back to the age of the Earth, there's another four billion years of Earth's history, and it's 88% of Earth's history, in fact, that we don't have fossils that are good enough to construct a granular time scale. So how is it that this has been resolved in the, in the 20th century, more often in the latter half of the 20th century? Well, with the recognition of radioactivity and radioactive decay uh, in the late 19th century, it became apparent that radioactivity and radioactive decay could be used in, in minerals that are radioactive, could be used as little clocks, chronometers that yield the age, in the right circumstances will yield the age of the minerals in the rocks. So that, t that time scale, if we just go back to it, is labelled with numbers in, in millions of years. And the numbers, the numerical ages of rocks are derived using techniques of dating a whole range of different minerals that preserve the daughter products of parent radioactive isotopes or elements in those minerals. And that's a very uh, mature field. It's called geochronology. Uh, the techniques, sometimes they use giant mass spectrometer type machines to analyse tiny grains. The, the uh, details, that little grain mount at the top of the diagram there, are tiny zircon grains embedded in epoxy. They're, they're smaller than the head of a pin, but machines like the shrimp in the middle there can actually yield an individual age on each of those zircons. And sometimes, if you look at the, the lower diagrams, you can get ages within individual zircons. So the techniques uh, are pretty clever, they're pretty refined, and they've given us a numerical geological time scale as well as a fossil one. But once you're back in the, in the Precambrian, the fossils really don't help us very much with the, with the time scale. So, as I said, the first question about the Tasmanian horridiscule was how old, and I've, I've talked you through some of this, but we were able, uh, my student Torsten, uh, standing there next to Marty Lan outside his house, uh, for his honours project, he analysed and dated zircon grains and monazite grains. All you really need to know about zircon and monazite grains in rocks is uh, the zircons come from the hinterland. They're washed into the basin. So the, the youngest zircon you find in a sedimentary rock is going to give you a maximum age of that rock. It's have to have been eroded out of something older and ended up in the sedimentary basin. The monazite, on the other hand, grows in the rocks, in the sediment, sometimes after they're, uh, some length of time after they're deposited. So they give you a minimum age of the, of the rocks that you're dealing with. And what Torsten found was the youngest zircons he had were aged at 1,452 million years, and the oldest monazites were 1,340 million years. So plus or minus, the age of the Tasmanian horridiscus site was 1.4 billion years. Lo and behold, almost indistinguishable from the age of the Montana examples. So that was the first bit of interesting coincidence, that the Montana and Tasmanian Horodiscia were the same age. Gets better than that, and this is where a bit of serendipity often comes into science. Zircons that are extracted from a sedimentary rock can come from many different terrains of many different ages. So there's often characteristic patterns. So you're not just getting that uh, maximum age, you can see much older zircons, and the patterns those zircons make reflect where they ultimately came from. And this is a, a, an approach that's used a lot in trying to reconstruct the distribution of continents on the Earth through time. So there's been something called a supercontinent cycle operating 
probably for at least half the Earth's history. And you've probably heard of Gondwana, and Gondwana was part of a supercontinent called Pangaea about 200 million years ago. There's another supercontinent about a billion years ago called Rodinia. And there's a, another one even older than that called Nuna. And the diagram on the right-hand side here is one reconstruction of Nuna. And if I don't know, people at the front might be able to read some of the labels on that. There's little bits of Australia uh, up in the top right-hand corner. Uh, the big belt with the red line through it has bits of what's now North America and Antarctica. So this, this is a, uh, a supercontinent when all the uh, continental pieces of the Earth's crust at the time were amalgamated together and then they separated through plate tectonics from one another over the next 800 million years and came back together again to form Rodinia about a billion years ago and then the same thing happened again. Rodinia split up and then it came back together to form Pangaea 200 million years ago. What came out of the zircon patterns from the Tasmanian Horodiscia locality was uh, quite unexpected. We saw the zircon patterns much more closely resembled zircons from the Belt Basin in North America than they did anything in basins of the same age in Australia. And this line of argument was used uh, in a paper that we published with Jackie Halpin, did a lot of this work initially. Uh, she wrote a paper that argued that this northwest corner of Tasmania rightly belonged 1.4 billion years ago as a little piece of North America and it's floated off over the, over the eons, moved around and eventually came to rest quite out of context. It's like nothing else in Australia. Uh, none of the older rocks in Australia came to rest in northwest Tasmania. So a bit of, bit of serendipity, we got a lot of mileage out of that. The work was, was followed up by a very clever student of Jackie's called Jack Mulder. Uh, and, he's, and, the, and he's made some major contributions to what's called continental reconstructions back in the Proterozoic. Uh, that's a, a diagram. So the green, that, that's another reconstruction of Nuna. So that's a black and white diagram of the whole supercontinent. So maybe something, there wasn't as much continental material then, but maybe something the size of Asia, uh, all the blocks of the earth together in Nuna. And Australia is up in the top, left-hand corner of that diagram, tilted on its side, you can sort of see the outline of the North Australian coastline. But the two, the green and the red blobs represent where uh, Montana and, and Idaho and Canada, the Belt Basin were, and the red represents where the Western Tasmanian Rocky Cape Group, as its name, would have been at the time. So what I'm going to do now is talk a bit more about fossils and in particular Proterozoic fossils and where they fit in the scheme of Earth history. Now this is a complicated diagram that I put up as the, as the midpoint of the talk essentially. Uh, I'm trying to illustrate a bunch of things that might have been going on in the world at the time. So trying to paint a very broad picture. Uh, there's a, a lot of effort being put into trying to understand the nature of the planet in Precambrian times. Uh, it's fundamentally tied to the development of an oxygenated atmosphere that's favourable for large and complex life. So there's a biological story that relates to a geochemical story of how the Earth went from in the Archean uh, with a carbon dioxide, methane atmosphere, nitrogen atmosphere, that if we jumped in a time machine and stepped out, we'd be dead within seconds, to a planet that's equi equitable for life as we know it. And to the best of our knowledge, the Earth's been pretty favourable to complex organisms for at least the last 580 million years or so. And that's marked by the first animals on that diagram. And there's other things going on there. There's a couple of important labels. There's something called LICA and FICA. LICA is an acronym for the last eukaryotic common ancestor. We're all eukaryotes. Our, our cells are complex and we're multicellular. We've got lots of different types of cells. Before multicellularity and animals, there would have been organisms that had simpler cells. Maybe algae are examples of a large group of organisms that has, has much simpler cells. But they're all, they're all eukaryotes. They have internally, the cells have a complexity. And before eukaryotes, the world was dominated by simple prokaryote organisms, archaea and bacteria, that were basically just sacks of loosely organised chemicals and DNA. So in the middle column there, I've used the same colours, but I've sort of labelled a broad classification of a prokaryote world before maybe 
two billion years ago. Uh, a protist world, simple eukaryotes were arguably around and perhaps abundant in the oceans. And then our world, a world that if you jumped in a time machine and went back 530 million years and went for a swim in a Cambrian ocean, you could probably have a feed on trilobites. They wouldn't, you'd have to wait a few tens of million years before you could go fishing. But nonetheless, you'd be breathing and happy and enjoying the scenery on a, on a sea floor that had some similarities to what you'd see in the modern world. There's uh, the last label I want to make a point about there. There's something at around 2.3 billion years ago that I've labelled in blue. Uh, it lasted for a couple of hundred million years. It's called the GOE, the Great Oxidation Event. So something happened around 2.3 billion years ago that there was a huge spike in the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. And it probably relates to the evolution of cyanobacteria, and that's labelled on that diagram at about 2.7 billion years ago. Uh, it took a while for the cyanobacteria to make enough oxygen, photosynth photosynthetic organisms to make enough oxygen to overcome all the uh, reduced components of the surface of the earth. But interestingly and unexpectedly, after that 200 million year jump in oxygen, the levels of oxygen in the atmosphere seem to have dipped precipitously again for perhaps another billion years. And that's sometimes referred to as the boring billion, but it's actually the time period that I'm going to be emphasising for the rest of the talk, and it's the time period where our horodiscia existed. Uh, now, the boring billion, and Indrani Mukherjee, one of the other people that have been working on the horodiscia, uh, she's been fighting a battle, as, as have I, to not use the term boring billion. It's actually quite an interesting part of Earth's history. Indrani likes to call it the brilliant billion, but I'm not quite sure if I'll go that far. But we can make up your own mind at the end of the talk. So you will see this red star of the last eukaryotic common ancestor. That's the last, organi last organism that we are descended from that on, a, on a continuous line. So I've zoomed in on the Proterozoic now, same, <coughs> same colours. We've got animals appearing 540, 50, 60 million years ago. You'll probably be familiar with the Ediacaran assemblages from South Australia and elsewhere, about to be declared a World Heritage Area. Uh, we've got a period in this history of labelled, there's plenty of animals, uh, and somewhere before perhaps 2.1 billion years ago, no eukaryotes, this prokaryote world. Uh, so just before I walk you through some of the examples of fossils from this boring billion or brilliant billion, the rhetorical question is how do you recognise a eukaryote in the fossil record? It's all right if we can look at cells and work it out for living organisms. It's harder in the fossil record, particularly if you're dealing with small things. No one would argue an elephant, it's big and it's complex, it's a eukaryote. If you've got something that's small and complex, it's pro as a fossil, it's probably a eukaryote. If you've got something uh, that's large and simple, that's when it gets argued. Small and simple, who knows? It could be a prokaryote, might be a eukaryote, no one's ever going to know. But large and simple, we get into some serious debates. Some bacteria are visible to the naked eye, can grow millimetres in length, some sulphur bacteria, they're prokaryotes. So getting back to the fossil record, if you find something large but simple, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a eukaryote. So what I'll do now is we'll walk through the fossil record, starting uh, with younger examples of protozoic fossils. We'll go past where our horodiscia are to the oldest possible eukaryote fossil. So this gives you context and perhaps emphasises why the Tassie horodiscia are potentially very significant. So these are some, this is an example of something called a vase-shaped microfossil. Uh, it looks, for all intents and purposes, like living testate amoeba. Vase-shaped microfossils are known in the rock record for the last 800 million years, the last 0.8 billion years, and they undergo some diversification around 0.8 billion years ago. So, yep, these are, these are eukaryotes. They lived in the ocean doing the same things that testate amoeba do today, probably. You go back a bit further, and this is a famous, the, one, the, the organism in the middle, or fossil in the middle, is a famous fossil called Bangiomorph. Uh, 
that a group of workers uh, that Nick Butterfield is basically the, the, his research group have argued for quite a while now represents the oldest crown eukaryote organism. It's something that looks exactly like some modern red alga. Red alga still exists today, so you can trace a lineage directly all the way back to Bangiomorph at a billion years ago. So red alga a billion years ago, large prokaryote. There are some fossils in China now that push green alga back to about a billion years, and they're illustrated on the right-hand side there with an example that was published a couple of years ago. So by a billion years, there's large eukaryotes that probably can evolved into things we know today. At a micro scale, there are things that have enough complexity, ornaments, uh, these, these things are the size of a pinhead or smaller. The, about 20 years ago, a lot of uh, press came out of the 1.4 billion year old Roper group fossils, and they were generally accepted as the oldest eukaryote fossils. But since then, there's been discoveries in China, the Ruyang group examples that push these uh, Spinose acritarchs is what they're called, back to 1.6 billion years. So it looks like we had eukaryotes thriving around 1.4, 1.6 billion years ago. What we don't know is were they dead end branches on the tree of life? Uh, and we also don't know what they really were uh, in terms of were they the uh, cysts, the reproductive cysts of an organism that we've never seen before? Were they a planktonic organism in their own right? So there's lots of interesting questions. There are, however, some big things in this time period of 1.6 to 1.9 billion years ago, and the one that gets quoted a lot is, has been given a name, Gripania spiralis, and the first example of Gripania was found in, the, in belt basin rocks, but it's also been found in older rocks in Michigan, uh, the Nuganya uh, Formation at 1.9. They're basically spiral-shaped coils, a few uh, centimetres long, found on bedding surfaces. The younger ones, the, the Ruhas group and the, and the Grayson formation ones, appear to have some chambering going on, so you perhaps use that as an argument that these things were a large uh, eukaryote organism. But the simpler, older ones are just long spirals, so we have this problem of large but simple. Is it a eukaryote? Is it some sort of big bacteria? Things get even more interesting and exciting. This is a discovery that made the front page of Nature in, I think, about 2011 of some blob-like features from Gabon that were 2.1 billion years old. They had uh, an internal structure to them, arguably, and there's been a bit of work subsequently in a more recent paper published examples of tube-like uh, features within these assemblages. So the Al Albani group, uh, based in, in France, would be arguing, it would perhaps they had, they would be arguing these are some of the oldest complex organisms. They don't say eukaryote and they don't say animal, but they're probably implying eukaryote from the level of complexity. It's interesting to note that this is back around the time or just after the great oxidation event. So in some ways, it's not nonsensical that there might be experiments going on in eukaryotes at this time, but whether they get big like this is, is more problematic. So, we keep going. The scientific debate gets even more interesting, and there's another group led by Stefan Bankston in Sweden who have been working on some fossils from India that they argue are also a red alga, uh, something called Ramathallus. It's in 1.6 billion year old rocks. If it really is a red alga, it pushes that last eukaryote common ancestor older than what the Butterfield Research Group would like. Butterfield doesn't want Leica much older than a billion years, but if this is a rotophyte, it pushes Leica back beyond 1.6. There's other, other ways of getting at this event, this process of eukaryogenesis, and, and that's using genomics and the differences in DNA. Way out of my comfort zone talking about this, but you can put a, a a DNA clock onto all organisms and work backwards through time to work out when Leica might have happened. And the best genomic estimates of Leica, and I can't read it because it's a bit far away, but it's around 1.7 billion years ago. So the Bankston arguments 
for a rotor flight, get some support by the genomic evidence that says Leica happened about 1.7 billion years ago. If that's the case, the Butterfield uh, suggestion is not supported. So that's the sort of tension within serious protozoic paleontologists at the moment. They're trying to understand Leica, and that has implications for a whole bunch of things which I won't go into here. Okay, so. <clears throat> so, to sort of bring things back home to Tasmania, uh, we've known about the Tasmanian string of beads for a decade or more. Uh, my student in 2011 did the original dating. We published a paper on the paleogeographic reconstruction in the links to Montana in 2014. Since then, not much has happened except in the last year or so, Indrani Mukherjee had a little bit of research money left over. So last November, we revisited the quarry, the, 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 what I'm now going to refer to as the Lahn fossil locality, uh, in recognition of the Marty Lahn's discovery of the fossils all those years ago. We, went, we had the ability to go back and do some more systematic sampling at the Lahn quarry. So to finish things off, I'll show a couple of slides with some of the uh, samples, some of the better things that we found, and hopefully convince you there's a bit more to be seen at the Lahn fossil locality than just the simple string of beads. So here's the group of us frothies, so friends of Tasmanian horodiscia, is what we call ourselves, uh, and we're at the quarry. Now, the quarry, as you saw, is a pretty bleak, black, wet-looking place and one of the challenges we have in being pretending to be paleontologists and collecting samples is being there at the right time. I've made about 10 visits to the quarry over the years and it's only been on a couple of occasions that the light's been just right or the hasn't been raining that you can actually see these things. So take the time if you're interested to have a look at the examples at the front of the room and you'll sort of see there they can be pretty cryptic. But I'll show you some examples of some pretty cool things we've been finding. Again, I'm looking at my screen. I'm not seeing much in the way of detail. I'm just going to step aside. OK, so top right-hand side, I think you can see a horror disc here that's running across the slab, forming a sort of branching pattern. There's a long string on the extreme left, and there's a detail of that next to it of the top corner of that specimen and what appears to be multiple branching horodiscia. So that's pretty cool. No one's described branching horodiscia before to the best of my knowledge. Whether they're really branching or individuals that have ended up on top of one another, we don't have answers to that yet, but very exciting nonetheless. We also have, if you look on the lower left, the slightly darker image, there are some quite large beads arrayed, arrayed in a little curvy pattern. Some of them appear to be in pairs and some of them appear to be perhaps four together. So this is not your characteristic string of beads, neither in size nor form. So that's kind of cool as well. Gets even better than that, there's some large things. And I've got in the middle at the bottom, there are some large blob-like forms. No idea what they are, what they represent. We've got a range of ideas that are possible. They're fairly nondescript looking but they're a feature within the rock that on occasions even are associated with horodiscia. If you look on the right-hand side of the picture there, you can see a horodiscia string on the left of that image, but there's a number of these little blob-like forms. And they're quite large. These are macro fossils. So that's uh, a small set of some of the more interesting stuff we collected. Things get even be bigger and better so the example there on the right-hand side is a, is a large slab. That's an inch scale, not centimetres at the bottom, of large tube-like features that have internal structuring to them. Again, we don't have a rigorous interpretation of what these might be, but they haven't been recorded before from the Lahn Quarry, uh, and they're clearly not just the Horodiscia string of beads. And there are other odd lumps and bumps, and the photograph on the right-hand side there is an example of some large lumps and bumps, sort of up to half a centimetre arrayed in lines, which again, are they giant horodiscia? Are they something completely different? So we've got a, a cornucopia of interesting forms from the middle Proterozoic. And 
As a quick aside, uh, I had a, a summer student doing a third year research project this summer where we were trying to understand why it would be uh, that we're getting this array of fossils and features preserved in this one locality. And it's really Darwin's dilemma. Darwin knew that the Earth was old and there was a long rock record, but he always pondered why there was this explosion of life in the Cambrian. Where were the fossils in the ancient rock record? And various arguments were, well, they're soft-bodied and they're not preserved at one end, or they simply weren't around. The organisms hadn't evolved and they weren't there to be fossilised. So that's the sort of two, two extremes. The rocks from the quarry give us some, I think will give us some insights into this. The top uh, right hand, uh, left hand side of the diagram is a thin polished slice of those layered rocks I showed you earlier on. So they're the little pale beds with the horodiscia occurring on the tops of those individual beds. When we look at the textures in those pale beds, the tops of them are very diagnostic of what we recognise from things we call microbial mats. And the, the colour photograph there is out, taken out at the uni farm in Richmond of leathery microbial mat that's grown in the intertidal zone. So that's, although these are fine, muddy, soft sediments, if I gave you a bucket of mud, it wouldn't be strong enough to preserve anything, hold anything. Binding that mud together with a prokaryote microbial assemblage has the potential to turn it into a mat-like substrate that in turn may be a mechanism for preserving these soft-bodied early protist eukaryotic organisms. So that's another direction our research is going to potentially take the land fossil locality assemblage. Ultimately, what we'd like to be able to do in a, in a big picture sense is get an understanding of what the seafloor was like 1.4 billion years ago, what the Proterozoic world, ocean world, marine world looked like. And this is an example I found in a, in a weird paper published in the Iranian Journal of Geology uh, reviewing Proterozoic fossils. And I think it's a very engaging uh, panorama of a seafloor. You can see it's got our string of beads on the left-hand side at the bottom, they've, they've made them sort of giant pearl size, so maybe they were, maybe they weren't. There's a bunch of other things in there. There's red algae and green algae. Uh, off in the distance, labelled number one are these things called stromatolites, which some of you may have heard of, but these would be microbial features constructed by prokaryotes, almost certainly not eukaryotes in deep time, and a, a bunch of interesting things. Now, this is, this is great, but what they're really doing here is pulling together stuff over that whole seven or eight hundred million years that I've been describing to you. So from a, a factual reconstruction point of view, it's about as good as this picture of early hominids <laughs> created by Hanna-Barbera in the 1960s. So I think, you know, we've got some way to go and the Horodiscia location, the Tasmanian Horodiscia, because of the diversity, because we understand the geological context well, I should have mentioned the sedimentary rocks there tell us that we're in a position on an uh, outer shelf below the effect of strong storms. So it's as if you uh, got in a boat and went well offshore in Tasmania today, but you stayed up on the continental shelf in deep water. So it's a, it's a fairly specific environment that we infer from the sediments of the Rocky Cape Group. So a whole bunch of stuff come together that tell us a lot more about the, the setting for the Tasmanian examples than uh, what's been known before, or what's even been attempted for a lot of these other Proterozoic fossil localities. So I said this was also a talk uh, that has historical serendipity or coincidences. So I'm going to answer the rhetorical question at the start. I, I suspect a number of people here know of Thomas Francis Marr. If you're of Irish heritage like I am, he'll be a hero. Thomas Francis Marr was one of the young islanders involved in the 1848 abortive, almost comical uprising. The young islanders uh, were duly tried for their um, upstartness by the British and they were all sentenced to be, uh, and actually it's quite interesting, it's a retrospective law the British introduced in order to deal with these people. I'm not sure if this had actually happened for a long time, but I think seven of them, seven of them were sentenced to be hung, drawn and quartered, if you like, in 1848. The public outcry was such that the sentences were commuted and Ma and some of his colleagues ended up in Van Diemen's land to be here for the rest of their 
natural lives. But Ma didn't stay very long. He was pro a prominent Irishman. The Irish in North America were helping the fight for independence for Ireland from Britain, and they arranged for Ma to be rescued. And after about a year and a half or two years, he handed in his ticket of leave. He got a ticket of leave straight away. He didn't have to do hard labour uh, because he was a gentleman. And I think he met Governor Franklin, or whoever it was at the time, who said, that's fine, as long as you promise to stay in your cabin on Lake Sorrel, uh, you'll be fine. But he, he did a runner and got himself to Waterhouse Island where he waited, I think, for 10 or 11 days before an arranged American ship rescued him and took him to New York in 1852, where he became sort of uh, fated by the Irish in New York. He made a living giving speeches for the Irish cause. Around the time of the American Civil War, he, he was tapped on the shoulder to form a brigade for the Union forces, a famous fighting 69th of the I Irish Brigade. And he saw uh, action, or his brigade saw action at a lot of the major battles of the Civil War, suffered horrific casualties. Ma was blown off his horse and wounded a couple of times. Uh, he had a bit of a reputation. His days in Ireland, a lot of the young Islanders met in the pubs in Dublin, which was probably appropriate and probably reflected in how organised they were when they mounted their rebellion. But he had a reputation by that stage as a, as a drinker, certainly by the Civil War times. And by, I think, about 1863, before the war was over, uh, President Lincoln, he, he, was, he was burned out. He probably had PTSD by any definition. He was burned out. Lincoln said, all right, in, in recognition of what you did, we're going to give you a tough job. You're going to be the secretary uh, colonial secretary for the state of Montana. So we have a Ma-Montana connection. Ma went to Montana where he was there for a couple of years and again that's a, a exciting story in its own right and why there hasn't been a HBO or Netflix series on Thomas Francis Ma has rather escaped me. It's such an amazing life. But after two years in Montana he'd made a lot of political enemies uh, and he was drinking a lot and unfortunately, in the summer of 1865, he fell off a riverboat into the Missouri River and drowned at the young age of 54. And the, that's a broad connection that links Ma and Tasmania and Montana and our Horodiskia. But it gets a little bit better than that. Remember I said the Belt Basin is the name of the basin where the Montana Horodiskia has come from. The Belt, Belt Basin is named for the Little Belt and Big Belt Mountains, which happen to be in Ma County, Montana, where I spent a wonderful sabbatical one summer in the late uh, 1990s. So that's the, that's the end of the story. I've squared the Ma circle. I hopefully convinced you that the Tasmanian Horodiscia and the Larne Fossil locality uh, are very significant in the scheme of Proterozoic paleobiology and maybe even the origin of all eukaryotes, of which we're part. Um, and I'll leave you with a little bit of doggerel or poem that I manufactured from something that you might recognise. I'm very happy to answer questions as best I can. Um. Uh, just to, uh, uh, some more evidence on the Thomas Marr story. If you go to Antietam Battlefield at a place called Bloody Lane, where 6,000 people were killed in one day, there's a big map of Tasmania on the, uh, on the uh, Antietam ba Battlefield, and it's in honor of Thomas Marr. He was everywhere, this guy. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, Americans, which I'm presuming you probably are or were, are much more aware of Marr and who he, who he was. It, it's, well, I, it's a phenomenal. I, I, I never heard of Thomas Marr till I moved to Tasmania. So, <laughs> oh. okay. interesting. Yeah, but maybe I've been mixing with too many people. Character. Sorry. He's an interesting character, and a very low-level Netflix thing might be in order. <laughs> I get if I have another lifetime, I'll write a screenplay. But there are a number of good biographies of his life, including one written by a Pulitzer Prize winner, which is very. Uh, engaging came out a few years ago. I've hardly understood a word. 
hardly understood a word, but I'm so excited because I live on the Tamar River, and when I go to the Tamar River, I see all this mudstone, and I'm sure there's some fossils in there, so I'm going to go back next week with my trowel and dig some up. <laughs> Good. I've, I've inspired someone to do that. That's a, a big tick, a success. I'm happy. I'll sleep well tonight. Peter, thank you very much for a wide-ranging and inter interesting uh, oh, discussion. Oh, sorry. Um, your mention of microbial mats in the eukaryotic uh, um, sequence that you mentioned put me in mind of uh, one point in the uh, MacArthur River Basin uh, where a um, in a very fine grain shirt, um, actual microbes were identified by a CSIRO uh, geologist, uh, filamentous bacteria. Yeah, and, I, I, and, and the age is 1.6, 1.64. Yes. So, so there, the MacArthur River lead zinc deposit, which I know very well, has been a natural laboratory for a whole lot of interesting stuff over the years. So what you're referring to papers in the late 70s by Dorothy Erler and probably Malcolm Walter and co-workers that were describing uh, microfossils in black chert that's intimately associated with the lead zinc mineralization and that's in essence, that's how I got into paleobiology and the Proterozoic, reading about that stuff as a young graduate student. And later on, when I went to do, when I got a chance to do field work in the MacArthur Basin, seeing all the stromatolites, you know, there's, there's a, a life signature. And again, over the recent decades, there's been this revolution in understanding of how the Earth went from this methane carbon dioxide poisonous planet to what we live on now and you know when I went to uni it was very simple the GOE came the world's great and evolution kicks off but it's way more nuanced than that and that's the boring billion comes into this too that if if eukaryogenesis really did happen 2.1 why on earth did it take another billion or so years before animals evolved it took 700 for uh, algae to evolve. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense in, to the, from what I know, and it's not a lot, but the, the biologists will say that doesn't make a lot of sense in the way evolution operates. It's sort of a constant mutation, selective advantage. So there shouldn't be these gaps. So there's a, a big, there's two, there's a dichotomy between the way people think about the world. It gets back to Bengston wanting Leaker to be at a billion. That sort of compresses everything time-wise, makes a bit more sense to a biologist. But as a geochemist, and I've worked with people and I've published papers about this aspect of why there was a seeming delayed rise in animals. Uh, and the geochemists have a worldview that it's to do with the atmosphere ocean system and how it became ventilated. It went up, then it went down again. It took a long time for that ventilation to take place. And that has implications for things like the phosphorus cycle, for instance, how much iron's in the ocean. Everything's the chemical cycles are connected and productivity is ultimately connected to that. So there's a bunch of stuff out there which, you know, it's sort of beyond my current narrow interest, but I've been interested in over decades and it all, it all talks. The silos, you know, economic geologists or deposit geologists have a silo to biologists and it's breaking these down, I think, is important. Sorry, I'm heading off in another lecture. <laughs> another <laughs> rant. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Just a just a quick one from Paul Lennox, who's just ah, okay. um, yeah, who's online for us. Um, thanks for an excellent talk, Peter. Uh, fascinated to hear about the age of these rocks I examined for the geological survey of Tasmania in the late 1970s. Paul Lennox. Wow. Okay. Did you see? Oh, I, I don't know. He's, he's hearing me, I suppose. Did... He, he's, he's hearing you. He's seeing you. So, how many fossils did you find? Because Martin Lan was always had his eyes open for odd things and as any geologist knows there's always odd things 
in rocks. It's making that connection to being biological. And, and, and in a way, this, uh, I suspect the answer is no, Paul, but in a way, I look on this as like the uh, he did hitchhike, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the spaceship that was parked in, parked in Hyde Park. You know, everyone know it had a, an invisibility cloak, but it wasn't an invisibility cloak. It's just everyone knows there aren't spaceships in Hyde Park. So when Paul was working on those rocks 30, 40 years ago, everyone knows there weren't big fossils, big eukaryote fossils in mid-proterozoic rocks, for the most part. So He says he didn't find any. Mm. Brilliant. Uh, do we have any more questions from the floor? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Uh, look, fascinating and, and really interesting to hear about something that's so close to home. I guess the question I've got is when you see metamorphism of sedimentary rocks over time, you often see the development of these crystal structures, um, graphitic type structures and, and things that can appear to be lifelike. And I'd be really interested to hear a little bit more from, from yourself around the, the characteristics of, of these, these fossils that um, led to your um, assumption that it is actually something that's organic in origin that does represent life from the past as opposed to just crystal growth and, and that sort of thing? Yeah, cr uh, crystal growth specifically doesn't matter too much because some of these things are big. But you're absolutely right. It's, I think Sagan said big claims need big proof, big evidence. So the history of the Horodiscia story has been from weird bedding plane marks with no claim for biogenicity to the 90s arguments that are way more nuanced than anything I was given, and I probably don't, don't remember half of them, but the paleo, paleontologist, the paleobiologist then named them with a genus and species and had that argument in peer-reviewed literature that the string of beads was an organism. We're not at a stage with any of the other features from the land quarry to hand on heart say they're not a sedimentary structure. Currents can move things around. They might be features that are created by prokaryote mat. Mat can be torn up and roll up and make funny features. But there's a, a lot of information out there. And, and one of the things, just an aside, we live in a way more visual world. You know, when I went to uni, these, these talking about the stuff from MacArthur River, there would have been a few crummy black and white pictures in a journal somewhere. You can go online now and you can see a hundred illustrations of microbial mat features and there's atlases of these things and they're all in colour and they're well reproduced. So that, so that visual stuff I think is really important and, and you're absolutely right. These things need to be put in a context of other sedimentary structures and the arguments have to be made that this is biological and this we don't really, you've got to be honest and say you don't really know. So yeah, it's, this is where we're at right now. And, Thank you.